with the surge of this covid infection in the second wave we also hear a rise in a new disease that is mucomycosis so whether the mucomycosis is a new disease well no the first case of the mucomycosis was reported in the 18th century and till date many cases have been reported in the literature so why is it alarming now with the rise in the covid infections and the number of cases we also have seen in the rise of number of the mucomycosis cases well it is postulated that the rise of the mucomycosis cases is due to the immunosuppression that is caused by the treatment of the coronavirus we don't have a specific treatment of coronavirus so we try a cocktail of drugs to counter the cytokine storm which is caused by the coronavirus which ultimately leads to the immunosuppression The mucomycosis is caused by a class of fungus that is zygomycetes out of which the rhizopus is the most common followed by the mucus species followed by the rhizomucus species the mucomycosis commonly involves the nasal cavity the paranasal sinuses orbit and finally the central nervous system the incidence of the mucomycosis is around 1.7 per million according to the US based study whereas in India it is around 14 in 1 lakh population that is very high compared to the global scenario now let's see what population does the mucomycosis generally affect so before the covid era the mucomycosis was commonly seen in patients with terminal cancers patients with uncontrolled diabetes patients with hemopoietic cancers and patients on long term immunomodulatory therapy but in the covid era uncontrolled diabetes stands out from the other causes it is noted that the covid-19 has direct effects on the beta cell of pancreas which leads to acute impairment of the insulin secretion and also destruction of the beta cells which leads to de novo development of diabetes so the uncontrolled diabetes is the most important factor for development of mucomycosis in the covid patients where we have seen that the serum ferritin levels are high in patients which is proportional to the viral load now this increased ferritin levels promote the growth of the fungus now the increased ferritin levels are commonly seen in uncontrolled diabetes also due to diabetic ketoacidosis and a defloxacin which is used to counter this high serum ferritin levels also gives rise to deposition of this serum ferritin in the sideropores of the rhizopus which ultimately leads to growth of this rhizopus fungi again the use of steroids and immunomodulatory drugs such as tocilizumab gives rise to more immunosuppression so all these factors give rise to the growth of the fungus so what are the symptoms which may raise suspicion about the mucomycosis patient may experience dryness or crusting of the nose the facial swelling may range from periorbital swelling to a swelling over the maxilla region or half facial swelling with the hemifacial swelling patients also will have headache some cases with involvement of the orbit may present with ophthalmoplegia or restriction of the movements of the globe patient may complain of diplopia or complete ptosis where there is a complete ptosis which means the orbital apex is also involved the blurring of vision or the loss of vision may only be the complaint as the mucomycosis commonly involves the vessels and the nerves So in this picture you can see a periorbital swelling and also a swelling over the maxillary area. The oral mucosal involvement may range from a necrotic material, eschar formation or the ulceration of the hard palate. The patient might just present with a central retinal artery occlusion. Also superior ophthalmic artery occlusion is commonly seen in mucomycosis. The breach in the nasal mucosa is postulated to be the most common cause of the entry of the fungus into the nasal cavity. Where there is a small suspicion of this mucomycosis in the covid or the post covid patients, it is necessary to take a deep nasal swab which is a bedside test and with the help of the culture techniques we can easily identify the fungus. The other investigations which can be commonly done is the nasal endoscopy where we can see a black eschar kind of a necrotic material also we can see that the turbinates are hypertrophied and there is a change in the color of the turbinates the imaging may give a specific diagnosis of mucomycosis 
in normal mri without contrast we can just see a hypo intensity of the fat or an iso intensity of the fat while in mri with contrast we can exactly note the areas which are affected by the fungus with materials such as gadolinium we can exactly note which areas are affected as we know that the mucormycosis affects the vessels it may also affect the perfusion which may lead to the necrosis wherever the contrast material is not going that area is generally affected with the mucormycosis so after a clinical or a radiological diagnosis or a diagnosis with an endoscopy is made we can plan to start the antifungals intravenous liposomal amphotericin b 5 to 10 per kg per day is the preferred antifungal which can be used for 7 to 9 days after starting off with the antifungals we can plan a surgical deprivement when only the nasal mucosa and the paranasal sinus is involved the ent surgeon may perform an fess surgery and do the debridement of the necrotized material in cases of predominant orbital involvement where there is no cavernous sinus involvement an excentration may be done in mild cases retrobulbar amphotericin b injection can also be tried which has led to decrease in inflammation in many cases so what is the use of this debridement actually after the debridement all the necrotic material is cleared and the tissue is more susceptible to this iv antifungal treatment if the necrotic material is still there the antifungals won't work in this case with the iv antifungals we can also supplement oral antifungals such as posaconazole suspension can be started with an 300 mg uh, twice a day followed by 300 mg once a day from the second day after the debridement is complete the paranasal sinuses should be drained with amphotericin b solution the most important thing is to catch mucormycosis as early as possible if the treatment has been started early the chances of inflammation and the mortality can be decreased the prognosis of mucormycosis is not very good there are mortality rates ranging up to 80% in patients who are not treated the survival rates comparing the duration of the lag time between the presentation and the treatment also varies 3 to 9 days lag time the survival rates are around 60% while in the patients with 10 to 44 days the survival rates decrease up to 44% when the good side of it is with the treatment with amphotericin b and the surgical treatment the better outcomes have been observed while with just amphotericin b and surgical treatment alone the survival rates have uh, been seen up till 60% while when both of them are used the survival rates have been seen up till 70% Mucormycosis is an aggressive fungal disease. It is emphasized that the early diagnosis and a strict sugar control is necessary to counter the mucormycosis. The sugar control should be below 150 mg per dl postprandial. With the routine blood sugar levels, the HbA1c should also be sent in all the covid patients from day 1. It is also recommended to avoid steroids in patients who have oxygen saturation more than 95. In all the covid admitted patients we should look for the warning signs of mucormycosis and also exclude the diagnosis of mucormycosis from day 1 of covid and also to avoid unnecessary use of broad spectrum antibiotics methylene blue is an upcoming supportive therapy for mucormycosis and many physicians have tried to mix the methylene blue with the oxygen to help counter the mucormycosis